Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Republican Club of Laguna Woods. Today, we have the honor of having Susan Shelley, one of the leading conservative columnists in California and a member of the editorial board of the Southern California News Group and 11 daily newspapers, including the LA Daily News and the Orange County Register, which I'm sure you've seen. She's also Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, which is the most influential taxpayer advocacy group in California. She is a very ambitious lady, highly regarded and extremely knowledgeable on issues affecting us today. Please welcome Susan Shelley. Thank you, Phyllis. It's great to see everybody. Good morning. And welcome to California on the edge of doing something to improve the situation. I think we are going to see much improvement. Let me start with the recall election because that is a very significant change in the political landscape. When Gavin Newsom was reelected with something like 62% of the vote, and then when he declared we were in an emergency last March and his approval rating went up into, I don't know, the high 60s, the 80s, I don't know where it was. Everybody just worshiped the ground he walked on, the governor who was leading, leading us into lockdown nationwide. The first governor in America to declare that no one could leave their house because there was a virus. How did that work out? Well, interestingly, it didn't work out very well. Uh, the two governors, Cuomo and Newsom, who hit everybody the hardest with lockdown restrictions, turned out to be the most incompetent mm -hmm. and the most arguably corrupt. And the governors who were, who were just vilified in the national press, like the governor of South Dakota, and the governor of Florida have done really well. They, they have their schools open, they have their businesses open, and they're doing really well as far as the numbers are concerned with infections and hospitalizations. This was the wrong path that we were on. And instead of correcting the course, the governor has doubled down. Now let's look at some of the things that have gone wrong in the last year to drive his approval rating down, down, and downer, which is one of the healthiest things I've seen really, because it shows that people in California are paying attention and that is step one, step one to making it better. So one of the things that's gone spectacularly wrong after he ordered all the businesses to close and no one to go to work and everybody's on unemployment, he didn't do anything to shore up the unemployment department. So the employment development department, absolutely overwhelmed, not competent to begin with, and absolutely overwhelmed by the volume of claims, ends up paying out 11 billion with a B dollars in fraudulent claims to people who are incarcerated, to international criminal rings, to people who are just fraudsters. $11 billion and perhaps as high as 30 or $31 billion and maybe more than that, no one really knows. They stopped verifying the identity of people they were sending checks to and at the same time, they imposed crazy restrictions on people who actually were unemployed, filing legitimate claims. I don't even know how they manage that. They froze 344,000 accounts and they had no ability to unfreeze them selectively. So as they were getting calls from people and getting the ID papers that they needed, they couldn't unfreeze the accounts because they didn't know how to do it. They didn't know which ones were frozen. They were working with Bank of America. They were blaming Bank of America. It wasn't Bank of America's fault. It was the Employment Development Department. And this is on Governor Newsom because he had a strike force and a task force and a report. He knew before this started, the Labor Department had warned all the states of the potential for fraud with these extra augmented federal benefits that were going out. California alone just succumbed to fraud. That's on the governor. And so is the vaccination rollout which has lagged all the other states in its efficiency. The vaccination rollout could have been similar to the flu vaccine rollout. Obviously there's a shortage of the, of the product, so it couldn't be exactly like the flu vaccine rollout, but it could have been local. It could have been local pharmacies, local schools, local governments, local issues to deal with all of this. And instead, the governor said, I think it should be command and control from Sacramento. This was what he said, command and control. 
to make sure that it's equitable, that we know who's getting the vaccine. So California gets all tangled up in red tape and threatens people's medical licenses if they vaccinate the wrong people out of order before they're eligible and starts investigations of hospitals for making extra vaccines available to people who want them rather than throw them out when they spoil. And this is in California, they were reported for this. Northridge Hospital in the San Fernando Valley was reported to the state by the county for vaccinating people in the wrong order. Is that how you're gonna have an efficient rollout? Hardly. What they did is they had big spectacular areas like Dodger Stadium, like Disneyland for helicopter shots of people getting vaccinated. And then all the politicians could go and be photographed there at their little portable podium making their speech about what a great job they're doing. Meanwhile, the people who are waiting to be vaccinated are having to drive long distances, wait in line, no bathrooms, no accommodation for people who are arguably not even in good health and not all that mobile. And they're having to go stand in line to be vaccinated at some super center instead of the local pharmacy, the local school where nurses are licensed to do vaccinations. It was just politics. It was all politics. And for that reason, no one can miss the fact that this is a completely incompetent administration. This is on him. And then you can get into the policies in general of just penalizing businesses and seeking to raise taxes and in general, making life unlivable in California. Some of these green policies, which are so expensive, are disastrous for people in this state. I don't know if people even realize that projects like the, the cap and trade program, which goes back to the Schwarzenegger administration, he signed the law that allowed that to be set up, but it's been continued and enhanced. The cap and trade program is essentially a hidden tax on running an engine. Anytime you emit greenhouse gases, you need to have a permit if you're a business. So this applies to refineries and utilities, just for starters, any kind of manufacturing facility. If you tax energy, the price of everything goes up. If you tax diesel fuel, the price of transportation goes up and the price of food goes up and the price of utilities goes up and people can't pay it. We have energy poverty in California. We have the highest poverty rate in the country when you take the cost of living into account. And the green policies also affect housing. For instance, California makes it very difficult to build housing in outlying areas. It used to be that housing was always built in outlying areas. That's the, the, the post-World post War II pattern is development going further and further out so people could buy houses and new communities being formed. It was declared sometime around the time that Al Gore was vice president that this was sprawl and this was bad for the planet because people commute to work. Well, now today, people don't commute to work. You could build everywhere and we're not, why? Because they still think that vehicle miles traveled is an impact on the climate and we shouldn't allow it. And so the, all of the laws coming out of Sacramento are, are emphasizing density. And people who live in suburban areas don't want density. That's why they move to suburban areas. So there are laws that are pending in Sacramento right now. Senate Bill 9 is one of them. Last year, it was Senate Bill 1120. It was the same bill. It would force cities to accept subdivisions of single family lots. Cities would not be able to say no to that. And if you think about it, imagine a street of single family homes and if the state of California says all of these homes by right can be subdivided into two or more, what happens to that neighborhood? One person sells to a developer and the developer knocks down one house, puts up two houses. Each house can have a granny flat in the back and a garage apartment. So that could be six residences where there was one residence and no requirement for parking spaces because we're all gonna ride bicycles to the train and then commute on transit, of course we are. If you do that, then the neighbors are impacted and maybe the neighbors sell and maybe the, the developers buy those houses and two houses become 12 residences with no parking. Now you have completely destroyed 
what was there as a single family neighborhood, the quiet enjoyment of everybody on the street has been impacted by the subdivision of some of these properties. And you get density and there's no parking and people are cranky and it's noisier. And you have people who are renters in a neighborhood that had been all owners. Now, what's the significance of that? If you intensify the population growth in an area, you increase the need for infrastructure, power lines, trash pickup, water, police, schools. You need all government services for the new population. So there will be taxes that will be put on the ballot. Taxes that will be paid only by the property owners, parcel taxes, for instance, or bonds paid only by the property owners. Well, now you've got 12 people who are renters, two people who are property owners. That's 10 to two people voting for taxes that the two will have to pay. That's where this goes. That's really not equitable. That's really not fair. And when you buy property based on the zoning that exists, to have Sacramento change the zoning when your local government is prohibited from doing anything about it is a tremendous impact on the lives of everyone in California who lives in a, in a single family zone neighborhood. These housing activists in Sacramento want to abolish single family zoning throughout the state. And that is a huge impact. You can be in favor of it, but recognize it's a huge impact on people who are not in favor of it. And what's their option? All they can do is sell and move. And they better move out of the state because wherever they move in the state, it could happen there too. And what happens to your investment? Maybe it does well, maybe it does badly, but it's not gonna be the same house you bought. And it's not gonna be the same street you wanted to live on in the same neighborhood. So this is what Sacramento is trying to do. It has to be stopped. It has to be stopped. This cannot be allowed to glide through at midnight on the last day of the session, which it almost did. It was just a few ticks of the clock that kept it from getting over to the Senate in time to pass at the end of the last session and has been introduced again. This is just one. This is all part of the green agenda, density instead of sprawl, apartments and rentals instead of home ownership. This is very political. This is very sinister, in my opinion. It is, it is trying to eliminate the consent of the governed, which is expressed through local government. You elect a local city council, they should have control over local zoning. And if you don't like it, you should be able to go to the city council meeting and tell them why they're wrong. But this time you can't go to the city council. They don't have any ability to stop this. It's been ordained from Sacramento. Similarly, we're seeing this in homelessness policy. Last April, the state of California announced that a month after having driven the hotel industry to the brink of disaster with the no travel lockdown, they announced they're going to lease 7,000 hotel and motel rooms to house the homeless. And they do this. They make lease agreements with a bunch of hotels. It's temporary, it's temporary. A couple of cities went to court, tried to stop it. And the judges said, it's temporary. And guess what? It's permanent. Now it's Project Home Key. And the governor has spent a ton of money, some of it tax money, some of it donated from um, behested payments. I'll come back to that. And Project Home Key is a project trying to buy hotels and make them permanently housing for the homeless, or maybe 55 years. I think they have 55 year contracts, which is effectively permanent. So that's what's going on with this. The cities have no ability to stop this from happening. They have to, if, if the city council picks out one of these properties and declares that this is gonna be a Project Home Key property and the state funds it, there is no approval process by which people can say, I don't think it's a good idea to have homeless housing right here next to this school, restaurant, daycare center, whatever it is. There's nothing anyone can do about this. It is exempt from local approval processes. I don't think that's right. It's temporary, it's temporary. It's just because of the health emergency and now it's 55 years. And the cities are deprived of the tax revenue from the hotels 
and they are saddled with the expenses of this population that needs services. So it's a huge impact. And once again, this was slipped through in Sacramento at the end of the budget process in a trailer bill that the project home key funds, which were coming from the CARES Act money and the various federal aid packages because of COVID, no one could say anything to stop it. And here we are. So this is a concern, this idea that Sacramento is seizing your governments locally, seizing control. And in the case of homelessness, so are the federal courts, where they will not allow cities to enforce anti-camping ordinances. And this is a problem. The Supreme Court could have heard a case on this and decided not to. That, I don't know if you saw the, um, the Pennsylvania election case, what that was about, if I can just digress and wander around the topics here, what that case was about was Pennsylvania's state Supreme Court extending the deadline for accepting ballots. And before the election, litigation went into the courts, into the federal courts, and there was a petition for the U.S. Supreme Court to hear it on an emergency basis. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't hear the case before the election. And they just decided they won't hear the case after the election. So they won't hear the case at all. What was it about? It was about whether the Constitution means what it says. The Constitution says that election laws and processes are controlled by the state legislatures, the legislatures, not the elected administration, not the governor, not the appointed election officials, not the courts, the legislature. In Pennsylvania, the legislature said, this is the deadline for returning ballots. And there was a lawsuit and the state Supreme Court said, well, you can accept them for three more days, three extra days. Even if they don't have a postmark, you can accept them for three more days. And that was the case that went to the Supreme Court and that was the case they wouldn't hear. And I think that's a problem because there were many states that changed their election rules at the last minute under pressure from lawsuits. And is that how it's going to be in America? That the legislature makes election laws and then somebody sues because they don't like it and they have a friendly person in the Secretary of State's office in the same party and they coordinate and they say, all right, well, all right, here's what we'll do. We'll make a settlement. We'll make a consent decree. We'll do whatever. We'll call it something else and we'll change the rules a month before the election and we'll accept ballots that have no postmark. Really? I don't think so. So the, the, uh, the problem with this is self-evident and the lawyers for the party that is trying to knock down ballot security laws are saying that every ballot security law is a voter suppression law. I saw a headline on CNN, which I had on briefly, and it said, Republicans push voter suppression laws across the country. No, no, it's not voter suppression to say that the elections must be legitimate, that there's a deadline. A deadline for, for returning ballots is not a racial or ethnic or classist discrimination. It's a deadline for ballots so they can be counted so that the people in office can't say, how many more do we need and have three more days to get them. I mean, this is self-evident. Ballot box stuffing has a long history in America. And that's the reason there are all these laws in all these different jurisdictions about signature verification and ballot deadlines and chain of custody and all the rest of it. That's how we got those laws because this goes way back to Grover Cleveland. So, it's difficult to prove there's no remedy for election fraud. Uh, once it happens, you're kind of stuck with it and the remedy is the next election. And that has happened several times where people running for the presidency have, have been victimized by alleged or apparent yeah. ballot box stuffing and have come back. Uh, most recently, Richard Nixon, who lost the 1960 election in Cook County, Illinois, and um, came back eight years later and won the presidency. And it has happened before. So this is a situation where you had illegal ballots that were counted. They were, they were real voters and they were real ballots, but they were accepted past the deadline illegally. They were, this happened in multiple states. At least six of the battleground states had issues like this with ballots that were counted in violation of the law. There was nothing that could be done about it. And the Supreme Court really didn't want to get involved. And we are where we are. 
with President Now, who is reversing all of these successful policies. It's painful to watch. Um, but I think the rest of the world kind of knows that the American people can do something about it in a way that they didn't know before. You know, be before Donald Trump ran for president, whether it was a Republican or it was a Democrat, it was the same foreign policy establishment and nothing ever really changed. It was just two different colors of the same object. And Trump was elected going very aggressive against China, going very aggressive against Iran, going very strongly for Israel. Things that they had always thought couldn't happen, happened. The embassy was moved to Jerusalem. We were warned for decades that if we did that, oh, it would just mean war in the Middle East, but they did it and it meant peace in the Middle East. Imagine that. And so it's painful to watch Joe Biden say, all right, well, we're getting back into the Iranian nuclear agreement, which allowed them to build a nuclear weapon in 10 years and gave them our money to fund terrorist operations around the world. And he wants to do that again? Really? That's painful to watch. And some of the other things, back into the Paris Climate Accord, which is nothing but a, a, an excuse to transfer your tax dollars to other countries. That's what that's about. They want your money. And they want you to feel guilty about in the Industrial Revolution and the success of the United States. And they want to call that a crime against the world. And it's the reverse of a crime against the world. It's increased prosperity. It's increased technology advancements. It's made everyone better off. And they want to call it a crime and have you pay reparations to the world for greenhouse gases. This is absurd. And, and to go down this path again, as I said, it's painful to watch. But I think everybody knows it can change. Everybody knows that the Congress can change in 2022 and the president can change in 2024 and things roll around faster than anyone expects. So tomorrow in uh, Florida, former President Trump will be speaking at CPAC and he'll be laying out a vision for returning to successful policies there will be effectively a shadow government through this administration because no matter how much the mainstream media and the tech companies try to censor opposing views, there are opposing views. There's a lot of people who hold opposing views. And this is not some obscure, fringy, minimal, out in the woods center of dissent. This is throughout the country. This is throughout the country. People want to live in a free country and they want the United States to have its own interests considered by its own government ahead of the interests of other countries. And that's not a revolutionary idea or a fringy idea. That's just a sensible idea and many people hold it. So overall, even though things in many ways look bad right now, the recall in California, the resurgence of Freedom, which is coming, which we've seen and which will be back. These are things that are reasons for, for optimism. And I, I think that you should not lose faith and you should not give up and hang in there. It's going to be okay. Thank you, Susan. Folks, I'm sure you have learned a lot today from our little presentation. For more interesting views such as this, please visit us at the Laguna Woods Republican Club on the fourth Friday of each month. Call for more information and to make a reservation. Also, find us monthly on Channel 6, just as you did today. Our flyer is available at the clubhouses, or you can call our president, Carol Blanchard, at 949-837-5558 or 949-837-5558. 5875. Her email is Carol Blanchard, all one word, Carol G. Blanchard, I'm sorry, at gmail.com. Hope to see you soon.